Hey, everybody, we are going to talk about payment stocks. Uh, we're going to talk about MasterCard. We're going to talk about American Express. And we might even throw Capital One and Discover in there. Um, these stocks trade at very different valuations, and we want to kind of dive into why. Before we do, please take a minute and check out fool.com slash Franklin, the link you see on your screen. Get the top 10 stocks to buy from our sponsor, The Motley Fool. The best way to support this work we're doing on YouTube, again, fool.com slash Franklin. So, Tyler, you, you, you brought this idea to my attention, and I've known for a while that, you know, MasterCard and Visa, for that matter, are very expensive stocks in terms of uh, price-to-earnings multiples and things like that. Um, I didn't realize the discrepancy was that high. Just to kind of give you some statistics, uh, MasterCard trades for about 31 times forward earnings. American Express trades for about 18 times forward earnings. Um, it, I know the short answer of why. Um, and, and there is a short answer of why there's a big difference, but we're going to kind of dive into, you know, what we think about these stocks. And it is a very important concept for investors to know, right? That just because a stock is more expensive, doesn't mean it's really more expensive or it really shouldn't be owned. You have to take into account things like growth rates and risk factors and things like that. Um, so Tyler, give us, you know, the short answer and, and build on it a little bit. Why is American Express such a cheaper stock than MasterCard? And is it a cheaper stock? Well, yeah. I, I mean, if we're looking purely from an earnings basis, it is cheaper. And it, it to me, it comes down to more or less one thing above all else. And that's the the type of network that both run. <clears throat> Visa and MasterCard. Well, well, I guess we can focus on Max, MasterCard here more specifically, but they run what is called an open-ended network. So basically, uh, if you're making a tra uh, making a swipe at a uh, you know a merchant or whatever, um, they're, they're you're using a my, my, <clears throat> sorry a MasterCard or a Visa open-ended network to actually facilitate the transfer of money. Uh, Visa or MasterCard get their, you know, they get swipe fees on it, and that's more or less what it is. There's, the, it, it, it's very, they don't have a lot of what you'd call credit risk or anything like that because they don't, they're not associated with the bank that actually issued the card. Typically, if you have a Visa or a MasterCard, you've got it from somebody else, whether it be, I think, the largest credit card issuer is JP Morgan Chase right now. I maybe you know that way more than I do, but I'm pretty sure it's JP Morgan Chase. And, or you get, you know, your branded card from your store or hotel or whatever like that. Those are the issuers and versus the actual payment network. Amex, on the other hand, is a closed end system where they not only facilitate the transfer, they're the bank behind it that's actually the issuer. And so they are taking on the credit risk that the bank would typically be taking on in these credit networks. And that to me is the biggest reason more than anything else that you see these wide discrepancies in valuation between these companies. Because when you assume credit risk, you, it's it's just a whole different ball game than being on an open-ended network. If you're an open-ended network, the greatest risk to your business is kind of, I guess you could say competition, like maybe somebody tries to undercut you with lower fees and you guys have to do a price war, but look, it's only Visa, MasterCard, and to a lesser degree, Amex. So it's not really like you're getting into price wars. Maybe you might get into some regulatory issues. There's some discussions about that right now. But the kind of the ups and downs of the economy and basically how much money is sloshing through the network at any time is your biggest risk. So if you see a de decline in actual transfer volumes, that's where you're actually going to see your declines. That's, But that's just pretty volatile. There's not like a lot of catastrophic loss involved in that. It's it's pretty it's pretty flexible. You're, you're not trying to scale down to anything. When you start to assume credit risk, and that's where we talk to talk about Amex and to a lesser degree, uh, we'll, we can kind of lump in Capital One and Discover because they're combining together. And so they're going to create a clues, probably going to create some sort of closed loop system, not too dissimilar to what we see with Amex, is when you start to see a decline in credit quality, that's where things or start you start having credit events where people aren't actually paying their credit card bills that is a whole different ball game for a company like Amex or like I said or or Capital One because then all of a sudden you're not just you know you're not even getting swipe fees you're getting nothing you're not getting your payment on on your actual credit card and that's why 
when you're looking at these things and you say, wow, Visa versus Amex, how the heck can one be worth 35, 40 times earnings and the other one be so cheap? And it's because basically the downside risk associated with a credit card company is considerably higher than it is with just have your open network transfer uh, kind of network. And just to give an example of this, like I said, I mentioned uh, Capital One, I'm picking on them a little bit because you know Amex tends to have a little bit higher income uh, clientele versus Capital One. They're, they're a, a little bit more of a generic issuer of cars. During the Great Recession, their stock dropped more than 80%. And it kind of gives you an idea of like what can happen to you when you start to have credit events and the market starts seeing the kind of effects of a credit event uh, on your balance sheet. And so when you're going to an Amex or uh, other closed loop systems, you're assuming that credit risk as the investor, and therefore you need more downside protection. And really the only way you can get downside protection is buying it at a much cheaper valuation because look, if I'm going to lose money, I don't want to have to spend 50 times earnings and not really get a, a good return on the upside. Yeah, it, it's it, a short, an easier way to say that is there's really no scenario that you could picture where Mastercard becomes unprofitable in in a bad times. Um, just to kind of, I'll show you I'll, uh, the the current margins. Uh, Mastercard and Visa both are phenomenally profitable businesses. Um, I don't know if people realize that. It, it, pretty much any other industry would would be very envious of what they make. Uh, MasterCard has a 46% net margin over the past 12 months. 46%. Um, it's mostly very high margin swipe fee revenue. So even if the we see a bad recession and global spending drops by 10%, which would be a very high, uh, very high amount, this would still be a wildly profitable business. It would be a little less, less so, but it would still be making tons of money. Amex has a 14% net margin over the past uh, 12 months. So an, an uptick in defaults could erase their profits in a in a a bad market. It's happened before. Um, so I don't know, uh, Tyler. Do you own any of these stocks? Uh, by the way, I owned Visa for a really really long time, but then it started trading for fifty times cash flow, and I was like, I, I think I'm pretty good here. I think I can find something else. Yeah, that, that's kind of my question. Yes, I get everything you said was spot on. Mastercard has a much lower risk. Um, risk profile than Amex, especially if a, a deep recession comes or something like that. It has no credit risk. Um, it, its revenue is just you know a, a percentage of how much people spend, which people still need to spend money if times get tough. They might spend a little less, but they still need to spend money. Um, but is that safety worth paying 50 times cash flow for, a business, for any business, especially one that's not growing that rapidly? MasterCard and Visa, they're both growing it. You know, the revenue stream should keep up with inflation and a little more over time. Um, you know, not, not too much. Uh, but the three-year revenue growth rate for these companies, Amex is actually higher. Um, Amex has grown revenue at a 21% annualized rate over the past three years. MasterCard's has been 18%. Um, granted, a lot, and that both of those are a little bit inflated. Both of them are coming out of the pandemic years when you know, spending was really kind of depressed. Um, but for 18% three-year revenue growth in a very high growth period, like, you know, like I said, coming back from the pandemic, is not enough to really get me to want to pay 40 to 50 times free cash flow for a business. Um, so I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm, we're, we're both too much value investors to, um, to see that and, and think it's a, a great idea. But hey, We've been, we could have, there have been a lot of times when we could have invested in Visa or MasterCard at an elevated valuation and would have made a lot of money. So I, I think the best way to explain uh, my relationship with companies like a Visa or MasterCard, um, they're the reason you keep cash around and you keep companies like that in a box behind your desk that says, in case of recession or a case of, you know, market panic, break glass. These are the kind of companies that when market panics come, they are going to be priced at more reasonable valuations. And when they are available, that's the time to strike. Right now, when everything's going great and it's 50 times free cash flow, eh, 
maybe maybe wait find something else but maybe just time to accumulate some cash but there will be there will come a time i know it sounds crazy because it's been what we've had two months worth of recession over the past 15 years something's gonna happen eventually and when it does companies like visa and mastercards are go-tos i I just don't know if that's the case in roaring bear bull markets yeah it's it's a little too pricey for my taste but uh thanks for joining me tyler Uh, i'd love to hear what everybody thinks Uh, leave us some comments and i'll do my best to address each of them individually I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. The Motley Fool is a company that provides investing insight and stock recommendations for investors of all skill sets and risk levels. You all know how much I love researching new stocks and trying to find the next best investment, so I'm proud to partner with The Motley Fool to bring you 10 stock picks from their popular product, Stock Advisor. Stock Advisor has beaten the market by more than four times, so go to fool.com slash frankel to get your 10 stock picks now. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor returns are 650% as of April 16th, 2024, and are measured against the S&P 500 returns of 148% as of April 16th, 2024.